G'day, Kate here from the Narrate team. We start a brand new series at Narrate this week called We Need You to Lead. Building on the foundation of last year's leadership series, Adam engages us with an intriguing concept of bullets versus silver bullets. So uh, I'm very excited this morning uh, to jump back into a series that we did last year about a year ago and some of you already commented like, wow, Adam ran out of material already. The answer is yes. Um, actually, what, what the answer is, is we, like you, I love leadership, love talking about leadership, love studying leadership, love how accessible leadership makes any conversation about Jesus, because it strikes me that the wisdom of God and so much of the wisdom of great le- leadership, they complement one another. And so this morning, we're, we're going to kick off a, a series that we've done already called We Need You to Lead, but it's because we're that passionate that the local church Uh, should be very good at equipping people, business leaders, parents, people in the community to lead and to lead more effectively. And, you know, there's there's an episode from the famous Andy Griffith show uh, that I think perfectly captures the why behind this series. Uh, In the episode of interest, Andy Taylor, that was his name, right? This is before my era. Uh, (laughs) Andy Taylor, the sheriff of Mayberry, uh, was out of town, which, which left his deputy in charge whose name was Barney Fife. So Barney Fife is the de- deputy, but he's a little intimidated by all the responsibility he has. So he deputizes the local mechanic whose name was Gomer Pyle. Is that correct? So Barney and Gomer are walking down the street one evening and they look up and the bank was being robbed. And instinctively, they just duck behind a car. They're quivering, they're terrified, they don't know what to do, they're just watching these bank robbers do their thing, and as they're stooped behind the car, wondering what in the world they should do, finally, Gomer, the newly deputized car mechanic turned deputy, he turns and looks at Barney and says, Shazam, we need to call the police. (laughs) And Barney turns and looks at him with this incredibly dejected, frustrated look and says, we are the police. Remember that one? You don't have to raise your hand if you do. Uh, I think that captures the why of this series, uh, because I think that's the situation uh, all of us find ourselves in. Uh, We find ourselves at work, at home, in the community. Uh, We may or may not have the title of leader, but we find ourselves cowering uh, because we recognize the need for good leadership, great leadership. And I don't know about you, uh, but the demands of leadership are so scary that what all too easily happens is we just cower in hopes that a good leader will show up and save us. And I think part of this series, the design of it is to say whether, you, whether you've been deputized or not, whether you're the boss or not, you are the police. Uh, we need you to lead. We need you to rise up and recognize what opportunities uh, you have and what things you can do about that. And so over the next five weeks, what we're going to do is talk about five leadership axioms, five ideas that probably for most of you won't be new, but maybe will spur new conversation. Maybe for a few of you, they, they will be new. But I just want to talk about principles uh, and then also talk about how uh, Jesus and the Proverbs in particular, how how they complement those. I think this is a great conversation and a great on-ramp for people who are intimidated by Jesus because it helps us see that Jesus isn't as far removed from everyday life as we so often think. And the axiom that I want to talk about this morning is actually, you know, at the center of narrate is this idea of gathering and scattering. And I suppose if we have another adage, or at least my desire would be that the next uh, little saying that we would think of is this idea of the daily leads to the dream. And this morning's compliments that. This morning what I'm going to talk about is this idea that I'm indebted to Jim Collins and John Maxwell to name a couple. Andy Stanley talks about this. Uh, but it's the idea, if we could just word it this way, of, of bullets, not silver bullets. Now, our Australian friends find that a little violent, uh, but we'll just push through that. Uh, I'm just kidding. She didn't make any comments. It's just, uh, it is a little violent, like guns, ah, bu- but bullets, not silver bullets. And so let me just start by kind of talking about what, what I mean there, uh, in case that, those, that, that's new terminology for you, because I'm sure the concept won't be. Uh, a bullet is, hey, that first date went great, so great that I'm going to take the baby step of a second date. A silver bullet is, hey, that first date went great, uh, let's sleep together because I love you, and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. Uh, One is just a baby step, and the other is a giant step that is looking for instantaneous solutions. Uh, A a baby step is, hey, that interview went great, and maybe you've worked for an organization where where this happened. And so the, the, the bullet is the first one went great. Let's do a second interview. And the silver bullet is, hey, that first interview went great. 
You're hired. In fact, you're the boss. In fact, here's the keys. In fact, you're in charge. Giant, giant steps. Uh, a, a, a bullet is I have an idea, and it may or may not be a good idea, and it probably has all kinds of rough edges that need to be shaved off, and so I'm going to invest a little bit of time and resource into that idea in order to push it forward a little bit, and if it's a terrible idea, the company won't bankrupt, the family won't bankrupt, we're just, we're just going to find something out. Uh, last year's Easter egg hunt, it was a bullet. Like, is this a need? Will this serve a need? We're going to invest a little into that, and if it doesn't work, we'll be okay. A silver bullet is I've got an idea, and I'm going to leverage the entire company, the entire family. If this thing doesn't work, we're, we're sunk. Uh, a bullet is I just went skiing for the first time in my life. I think maybe I'll go a second time. A silver bullet is I just went skiing for the first time in my life. I'm going to go spend $500 on my own gear, and then I'm going to the base camp to spend another $500 on clothing. You, you get the difference. It's, it's little baby steps versus mega steps. Uh, have you ever noticed how, how prone we are, and I would put myself first in this category, to looking for the quick and the instant, the easy? Like, have you ever just noticed that you're hardwired, and it would seem like advertisers, especially advertisers on TV, uh, but everywhere, that they, they know that in, inside of us is the idea, is the want for instant, for get rich quick, for a little bit of investment, giant return. Inside all of us is looking for the solution, whether it's to lose weight, uh, whether it's to find a spouse, whether it's to have a successful business, whether it's to have a good career. We're, we're looking for that thing that'll take us from where we are to where we want to be in about one second. Have you noticed that in yourself? Uh, my, my first memory of this tendency in myself, and man, it is, it, it's like the force, only it's a negative force. It's like it is strong with me. Uh, it, 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 my first memory was in 1989. Because you know what came out in 1989 when I was a sixth grader? The Reebok pump. Do you remember the Reebok pump? It competed with the Nike Jordan Air Flight, which was its own iconic shoe. The Reebok pump uh, had a little pump on the tongue and, and bragged about air chambers in the shoe. I mean, it increased your vertical by 20 inches easily. <laughs> Dominique Wilkins was the original endorser. Some of you are like, those of you who don't know what checks are, you also don't know who Dominique Wilkins is. Uh, he was Michael Jordan's rival for a long time. He endorsed it first. And then the sec second guy to endorse the, the Reebok pump was none other than anybody? I'll give you a clue. He was famous for his blind dunk in the slam dunk contest. D. Brown. Who, who said that? Oh, yeah, Clint, of course. Good job. <laughs> D Brown, and then they came out with the black Reebok pump. Do you remember that thing? I mean, it changed your so social life 180 degrees. <laughs> I, I remember I went to school with a kid. I was in seventh grade when the, when the black Reebok pump came out, I, and, and the kid that was the envy of everybody, I even got to spend the night at his house one time, his name was Jay Love. I mean, with a name like that, right? Like, could have been Rico Suave, but it was Jay Love. He had the maroon leather jacket. He combed his hair back. He had the black Reebok pumps. He had Z Cavarici jeans. Remember those? And bum equipment shirts. He, 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 was, he, was, he was the deal. And I remember I spent a weekend, uh, one weekend at my grandpa and grandma's, and they lived in Billings near the Rimrock Mall. And I snuck over to the mall a few times and just like drooled over the black Reebok pump because I was sure if I could show up on Monday with the black Reebok pump, my name too would be Jay Love. <laughs> Wouldn't quite give me Z Cavarici jeans, but hey. And I can still remember sitting in the curb, sitting at the curb. My mom picked me up on a Sunday evening. Uh, I remember sitting in the passenger seat while I was trying to persuade her before she pulled away and left Billings in the dust en route for Laurel, uh, just begging her for the black Reebok pump. Mom, I've got to go get the black Reebok pump. It didn't, it didn't happen. You ever noticed? Like there's that desire for the single thing. The single job, the single relationship, the single experience, the single product, the single thing. And if you can land it, life is different. It's, it's different forever, and even more so, it's, it's different instantly. <clears throat> One of the stories that I, I've re read here in the last couple of months that captures this well is the compare and contrast of HP versus IBM. Some of you will remember uh, that in the 1990s, HP and IBM, they were big players in the technology world. HP, interestingly enough, uh, started by Hewlett-Packard. They, they, they were a 50-year-old company by 1992, I believe it was. 
And it took them 50 years to grow that company to a $15 billion a year annual revenue a year company. That was a terrible sentence, but you know what I mean, right? $15 billion took them 50 years to get there. In the next seven years, uh, they, they would grow HP from a $15 billion a year company to a $45 billion a year company. So, so they, they had this gigantic return in, in a fraction of the time. I believe it was start, starting in, uh, in the late 90s, 1997 maybe. Sorry, my ears are fuzzy in my head. Uh, they had five straight quarters of negative returns. And so the board of directors said goodbye to their CEO, and they went looking for a hire. And, and research tells us now that, that the type of hire the board of directors was looking for was a splash hire. They, they wanted to hire a person who would instantaneously turn the company. And so they turned to a woman uh, pictured there. Go ahead. Yeah, her, her name. Anybody ever know this, who this lady is? Oh, good, because you won't know if I pronounce her name wrong, because it's tricky. Uh, Carly Fiornia. She had just been, been labeled by uh, Forbes magazine uh, as, as a super saleswoman. She was voted that year as the number one most powerful businesswoman in the world. She beat out Oprah. I mean, Oprah. She, she, she was number one over Oprah. She was the celebrity that they wanted. Now, you contrast that with IBM. IBM in 1992, after a strong run, hit its own dark days. They had several quarters of negative returns. They, too, turned to a new CEO, and they hired a guy named Louis Gessner Jr. Louis was, in almost every way, Carly's opposite. Day one, Carly stood in front of her, her company and a mass of media and declared everything that was wrong with HP and everything that she was going to do to fix it. Day one, uh, Louis with IBM was asked for a similar type of speech. In fact, uh, USA Today offered to run a 100-day article. They wanted to record his first 100 days in office, documenting his success. He refused. In fact, he said the last thing IBM needs right now is a vision. Now, it wasn't that he didn't understand the need for good vision, but he went on to explain, I got to figure out four things. I got to figure out who's in the right seat in the bus and who's on the wrong seat in the bus and who needs to be let go. Second, he said, I, I got to figure out what's happened to the profitability of this company. Third, he said, we've got to figure out how to increase our cash reserves. We have no cash flow. And fourth, he said, IBM used to be synonymous with customer service. It's not anymore. We got to figure that out. And the capstone of that was, he said, it's going to take me three months to even begin to answer those questions. I don't have a vision for you. Day one, uh, Carly was requested uh, by all the mass media outlets, all the big players, Diane Sawyer, Vogue, Oprah, Business Week, all the big media outlets. They wanted a piece of this story, this, this awesome all-star exec who had just been hired. Day one, Louis decided that he wasn't even going to the corporate headquarters. In fact, he decided that the best use of his time in his first day in office would be to go to an international manager's meeting. There he had to pound on the door because nobody recognized him and they wouldn't let him into the meeting. There's this contrast over and over. In the first week of her leadership, uh, Carly, Carly recorded a TV commercial in front of that famous garage where Hewlett Packard began, like Amazon, it started in a garage. And she declared emphatically for the world to see all the promising new things she was bringing to the company. Louis, on the other hand, when he was requested for interviews, uh, simply said, we're going dark for a while. The best thing for this company is for us just to step away from the media. And yet, of course, the, the, their, their returns were also quite different. Year one, Carly uh, raised HP's profitability by 7%. Year one, Louis raised uh, IBM's profitability by two and a half, I believe it was. Carly never had 7% again. In fact, Carly year one went to seven, and for the remaining years of her tenure, it went down. She eventually left a failure. Louis first year was two, two and a half, and every year it went up, and he left his leadership of IBM a, a raving success. And analysts will say that the big difference between the two uh, ideas, the two companies, was one company went looking for a silver bullet. They went looking for that one sale, that one pitch, that one product, in their case, that one hire that would instantaneously change the direction of the company. IBM, in, in strong contra contrast, 
recognized their problems were deep. Their solutions, they didn't even know what they were. And that it would be a long series of difficult steps for them to turn the company. Now, it's probably not lost on you that one of those companies, I don't even know if they exist anymore. And IBM's, they're still around. They're still a player. Uh, Jim Collins, in, in one of my favorite books, I've referenced it often in December, he wrote a book called How the Mighty Fall. His question in that book was, well, why, why did companies like Circuit City fail? Uh, why did companies like HP say, uh, fail? He wanted to know what happened to these companies who arrived at incredible success and then cratered. What happened there? And the first thing he, he did is he paired up companies who dealt with similar situations. And so you couldn't simply say uh, that there, there was something irreparable about the company. He then boils down his finding into five things that, that the companies who ultimately fail, uh, why they failed. And these aren't just companies that are startups. These are companies like Circuit City. And some of you are like, I've never even heard of Circuit City. Circuit City was the largest, uh, the, the largest private electronics big box store going for a long time. The third thing that Jim Collins highlights is, is what he calls overreaching for salvation. What he says is the third thing that causes a company, those companies who ultimately did fail, HP versus IBM, is they went looking for a silver bullet. They went looking for a product. In the case of Motorola, they went all in on a particular phone. They went looking for this single product, this single hire that would change everything. And I guess this morning where I want to get you thinking and challenge you as you think about life and work and your own leadership is the question isn't, are you prone to this? Uh, the question is, are you managing it? It's in all of us. How are you doing with your own desire for quick and easy and instant? H how are you doing in thinking that there's going to be something and you're going to discover it and overnight all your problems are going to go away? These, these, these trends, these, these issues that maybe have taken decades to develop, you can solve them overnight. How are you doing with that, that belief? You know, I've talked a lot about how last year around this time, a friend who's not even from Helena uh, sent me to a, a leadership conference called Ultimate Leadership, and it's led by John Cloud and Henry, or John Townsend and Henry Cloud. So it was somewhat psychoanalyst, literally kind of therapy stuff and some leadership training stuff. And these are two of the most sought after coaches in the world. And I was honored to go. And it wasn't until Wednesday of the conference, because they asked you to show up saying, here's what I want to work on. There was no question for me. I, I was there to work on leadership, but more than that, I was there to work on my anxiety. And it wasn't until Wednesday of the conference that I realized I, I was there looking for a silver bullet. In fact, I remember Wednesday morning, after processing some stuff in our, in our group, coming to the realization that, that the struggles that I have with anxiety were struggles that I would have for a long time, if not for the rest of my life. Because part of you, those of you who struggle with that, you know that the only way you really win is to continue to stretch yourself, and so therefore you have to struggle for the rest of your life. And it was a depressing observation for me. Uh, and it was then that I realized, wait a minute, I, I was fully convinced that I would come here I would learn some magic trick, some, some crazy sentence, some verse in the Bible, some breathing, some single solitary thing, and I'd walk out the door never fearing or experiencing anxiety again. It's, it's that thing. Sometimes it's the Reebok pump, and sometimes it's why we go to counseling. You know, I was reflecting this week on, we send almost everybody who asks us for counseling to, to a local therapist, and that's not, not, it's not because... Kate and Caleb and myself and, and, and Sarah and Jenny, it's not because we don't have this sincere desire to meet with people and offer friendship to people. It's because of two things. First, we recognize there's training we simply don't have. But more than that, we recognize there's, there's, there's a process to getting well. And generally speaking, when someone wants to talk to me about their marriage, we sit across the table and the assumption is that in this hour, I can solve it. And yet when I say that, and it's not your problem, you go, no, that's ridiculous. And what I love about what we have going on with this therapist is it's a commitment to the long haul. It's a commitment to the work. It's a commitment to, man, th this, this could take years. In the case of my anxiety, it's taken me 35 years to think and behave my way into that problem. What's for me to think that a single conference, a single book, a single sermon is going to solve it? It's work. And to me, this so parlays uh, the wisdom that we find in Scripture. Because as you turn, especially to the book of Proverbs, what, what you see is a promise that, that wisdom, 
Wisdom pays later. It doesn't pay instantly. Wisdom, there, there's a return on wisdom, but it comes later. In the end, you might say, wisdom pays. That's the message of Jesus. L- listen to Proverbs 3. I've been bouncing around on this one for months. Because in all its simplicity, it captures so much of life. Uh, the, the, the writer says this, let love and faithfulness never leave you. So you're looking for a formula for success. Here we go. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Listen, I don't know whether you're wrestling with marriage or business or friendship, but there's, like, there's really nothing else you can say about success in those areas. Keep your promises. Be faithful. Be a person of your word. Put others above yourself. Let me ask you this. How, how long does it take for you to trust the, the, that a boss or someone you're dating, or a new friend really loves you, uh, that you can really trust them? It's not instant, is it? It's, it's time. There's this promise, like God, God is saying, I, I can help you with your life, but you'll need to remember that it's baby steps. Wisdom pays slowly, you might say. And listen to, to the promise. Then, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. But how long is the Then. Those of you that have a successful career, how many little tiny baby steps did it take to get you there? Like th- those of you that have a good relationship, you'd be the first to say, no, 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 that, 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 like a wedding day is important. It's not what makes a good marriage. It's all kinds of doing the right thing over and over and over and over again, isn't it? And that can be discouraging. Uh, if you don't listen to, to, to Dave uh, Ramsey's Entree Leadership Podcast, there's one in particular I'd recommend with the guy from um, Dirty Jobs. What's his name? Like Mike, Mike Rowe. And he talks in there about how uh, we often go looking for a career and we just want to like get the degree that'll give us the career. And he says, when you analyze people who have successful careers, what you recognize is it was just a series of faithfulness, to t- a series of tasks performed faithfully. And then they look back and they go, wow, in the last 20 years, I've built a career. You, you, can't, you can't be handed a career on a slip of paper. It's, it's, it's faithfulness over and over. And I see this is where I go like, I know I'm patronizing you. you. You know this stuff. What I'm trying to do is just awaken us uh, to wherever you're at in life. In what ways are you reaching for a silver bullet? Listen to the way Peter says it in 2 Peter. I, this is one of those verses that I, I've read it probably a hundred times, and I always just get overwhelmed by it. And that's what I'd like to do here, is overwhelm you with it. Uh, Listen to what what he says. I mean, this is like, but wait a minute, Peter, this would take me a lifetime. Exactly. Uh, For for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Anybody looking for anything to do? (laughs) I mean, wow. I, I love Dallas Willard uh, when asks, how do you live out the Christian life? How do you follow Jesus? He says, just go do the next right thing. Just go do the next right thing. And when you've done that thing, go do the next right thing. And part of his point is, in trying to do the next right thing, you'll be reminded uh, that, hi, my name is Adam, and I am broken and desperate for God's grace. You'll be reminded of how hard it is to even do that, how much you have a need for God and his spirit to empower you to even do that. Just go do the next right thing. You know, one of the things inspiring to me about Jesus' life is you you couldn't find somebody with a bigger vision. I know you've got a, a company and you're excited. I know you've got a career and you're excited. I know you've met her, you've met him, and we, we have these giant visions for our lives. Uh, no, nobody's ever had a bigger vision for his life than Jesus. Now, those of us who are Christ followers say, well, that's because he was God in nature as well as man, and God kind of gave him that vision, but it was gigantic. And yet his story doesn't equate to called and quick, and it doesn't equate to called and easy. Just, just listen, I was reading through Mark um, a couple weeks ago because I listened to my own sermons and thought I'm going to read through uh, the, this gospel. And you remember, Jesus is baptized, And a voice from heaven says, this is my son. Man, I'm crazy about him. Follow him. Listen to him. There's this crescendo, like, ah, kind of moment. Kind of like when when the coffee has been brewed. Ah! And you expect the white steed to show up and the crown, and Jesus jumps on the horse, and the rest is history. Listen to what's next. At once... 
The Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, who was with the wild animals, and the angels came and attended him. His crescendo crowning moment, literally, the moment where God said, here you are, here he is. The next thing that happened was 40 days of parched mouth, hard to eat temptation. And what, 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 was, what were the temptations? You ever thought of this? The temptations were all quick and easy. Hey, uh, Jesus, let's just go to the top of the temple and you throw yourself down and then God will rescue you because he has to rescue you because you're the hope of the world. And boom, what? Instantly, everybody will know you're the one. Jesus, just, just do something miraculous. Let's just do something loud and everybody will know you're the one. It's the, the temptations, they, they all revolve, if nothing else, around quick and easy. The next thing that happens, so you go, okay, so we made it through the 40 days. Then the white steed shows up. No. After John was put in prison, that's the next verse. Now listen, if, if the MC of the game is thrown in prison, what does that mean for the star player? It means Jesus is going, oh, geez, this thing. See, called doesn't mean instant. Called doesn't mean easy for him. And then the next thing, you know what the next thing is in Mark? He calls some disciples, James and John, Peter and Andrew. And I have to wonder if part of the way Mark is constructing his story is Mark going, I wonder if Peter and John and I wonder if those first disciples, I wonder if they knew that called doesn't mean instant. The call doesn't mean easy. Maybe you're someone who you started a relationship with God because someone told you all of your problems when it would instantly be solved. And the reality is, is all of God's blessings come with complications. Following him comes with gigantic complications. Call doesn't mean instant, does it? I was listening to, to a guy who, who does some guest lecturing at Stanford on creative entrepreneurship in their MBA program. He's a Vietnam veteran and now a very successful entrepreneur. And of course, so of course, when he ends up in the classroom, one of the first questions asked is, you know, what's the parallel between leading a small group of guys in the jungle in Vietnam and being a successful businessman? And one guy who, who was there when he asked the question said that he was asked that very question. He stopped, he thought, and then he simply said to the class, he said, when you're in the middle of the jungle and there's only a few of you and you're surrounded by the enemy, the wisest thing that I learned to do was to say to one guy, you've got from here to here. And to say to the next guy, you've got from here to here. And then I would say, I'll take from here to here. And then he would say, take your guns off automatic, stop, breathe, think, listen, and fire one bullet at a time. He said, what I learned in Vietnam is there is no silver bullet. And what I've learned in entrepreneurship, what I've learned in leadership, is you have to be committed to the grind. You have to stop looking for the instant, easy answer. You know, one of Jim Collins' metaphors in my favorite book of all time, of course, other than the text, uh, in a book called Great by Choice, uh, he uses this very, metaphor, or this very idea, but he uses the metaphor of shoot, shoot bullets, then cannonballs. And he creates this scenario where he says, imagine that you're in, it's in the late 1700s and you're off the coast of France and you're in a wooden vessel and you look up ahead and some distance away is what is clearly a pirate ship approaching you. He says, yeah, everybody knows uh, the end result if you don't somehow avert this disaster. And so you summon your guys who, who are in charge of the cannons and they tell you that the person in charge of filling up the ship full of gunpowder didn't do their job. And so you've got enough gunpowder to shoot one cannonball. He says, successful companies and unsuccessful companies, successful people and unsuccessful people at this moment do two completely opposite things. He said, companies uh, like HP, companies like Circuit City, individuals who are looking for quick and easy, what they do is they do their level best to aim the cannon. They load it up with their last of their gunpowder. They, they put a cannonball in there and they fire. And if it hits, then either they'll sink that ship or they'll create enough work that that ship will be preoccupied and won't be able to attack them anymore. And if it misses, they're done. He said, not so the, H, uh, excuse me, the IBMs of the world, not so the Southwest Airlines of the world, not so those, those who, who have great marriages. He says what they do is they recognize that a little bit of gunpowder won't be missed. 
And so they load it in their gun, their little handgun, their little revolver, and they take aim, and they shoot, and they miss by 100 yards. And they take that information, and they hone their ideas, and they dial it in, and they load it again, and they shoot this time, and this time they miss by 50 yards. And they steal a little more gunpowder from their reserves, and they put it in their gun, and they load up their gun, and they shoot a third time. And having continued to kind of hone their ideas, this time they miss by 10 yards. A fourth time, he said, they go through the whole process again. This time, the little pathetic uh, marble bounces off the side of the ship, and they've hit it. And then, he said, then they shoot cannonballs. Then they take the last of their remaining gunpowder, they load it into the cannon, they put their last cannonball, they take all the information they've learned as they've been shooting bullets, and they take aim, and they avert disaster. Now listen, I, I don't know what you're working on, I don't know what's at the forefront of your mind. I know you wouldn't be here if there wasn't something, whether it's a marriage or a business, whether it's a career, whether you're a student trying to figure out life and why you're even here. I don't know what you're working on. But I know that the desire for a silver bullet is there. I know that the desire that there's one single product, one single relationship, one single experience, one single person, one single idea, one single piece of paper, I know that there's that desire to believe that if you can just get that, you'll never need anything again and all your problems will be solved. I guess this morning I'm here to, to challenge you on that, to suggest that thousands of years of wisdom and, and, and Jesus, God in the flesh, is here to go, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Wisdom pays later. Listen, I don't know what you're working on, but, but I know that God made you, that he made you for relationship with himself, that, that when you step into that relationship with him, when you, when you say yes to that, his spirit indwells you. And I know that at that point, you become an emissary of his grace and mercy in this world. He gives you a purpose. And I know that we all so quickly confused called with instant and called with easy. And I guess I just want to challenge you. Go talk to others. Open up your text. Engage the God of the text. And what you'll see is a God who says, I love you and you are called. And man, it's going to be some work. Listen, if you're here and you're still trying to figure out what it would mean to follow Jesus, what it would mean would be to say yes to a God who made you for relationship with himself. To, to say yes, I am broken and desperate for God's grace. And then to eagerly anticipate a God who puts things back together though you'll never be whole on this planet and who gives you a purpose, a calling. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.